William Henry is an investigative mythologist as well as an author and a speaker and a pretty deep thinker. Thanks for jumping on the show tonight, William Henry. Hi, Ian. How are you doing? Good. And you're also, are, you, are we talking to you from Nashville tonight? Yes, I'm in Nashville, yes. Mm-hmm. I used to live in Nashville. Uh, that's what I heard. You, were, uh, you partnered up with somebody on WKDF here. <laughs> Did you know him? Did you know the Duke by any chance? Of course, yeah. I I had moved here to Nashville in 1981-82, and uh, I do remember the Duke, sure. (laughs) He's the best. Uh, And, and yeah, and in fact, I just got an email from my friend uh, Demetria Kaladimos the other day. I know Demetria. Asking about uh, 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 our family after the 35W bridge collapse, and so Ah, I went to to college with DK. Yeah, and her lovely sister. Yeah, you know Thalia? Yes. The wild one. So, <laughs> so, so, William Henry, I, uh, I, I'm fascinated by some of the work you've been doing. And in fact, I, I got to know a lot of it, uh, more about you this week after watching, uh, your DVDs and, and having a chance to sit down with, uh, with your book. And we'll talk about all of those things. But let me just say, I was thinking, I was looking at one of your DVDs uh, shortly after, um, I'd been doing some work on the, uh, the covering of the 35W bridge collapse here in, in the Twin Cities, which has been getting a lot of uh, coverage. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I was thinking about them a little bit about the symbolism of bridges. And, and I don't, you don't have to reflect on this at all, and it doesn't really have anything necessarily to do with your work. But I know you, you often look at symbols and stuff, and I, I, I've been really playing with that idea of why it is that this bridge has captured our imaginations so much, um, not just because of the loss of life, but I think there's something about the idea about crossing over things and how vulnerable we feel when we're in transition from terra firma over here, over something like a river, till we get to the other side. And there's just, you know, so many news stories about people who have been uh, really having to seek help even at the thought of crossing over the bridges that they had normally taken for granted in their life. And I don't know, I saw deep symbolism in that. Oh, absolutely. You know, in fact, everywhere I've been here you know, the past few days in Nashville, and people are talking about the bridge. And so you're right, it's it's resonating uh, at a very deep level with people. And I think that's a, a very interesting observation that it has to do with this idea that we feel like we live our lives on a solid foundation, but sometimes that's challenged, and then we're forced to or compelled to to reexamine certain things. And unfortunately, for the the folks crossing that bridge, it was uh, an, ab- an abrupt reexamination, unfortunately, but uh, it happens. And so I always look for the higher the higher benefit. I mean, you, you have situations that emerge like that, and so it's up to the rest of us to kind of take a look at it, attach some personal meaning to it, and learn uh, uh, something hopefully positive from it. Uh, the personal meaning I attach to it is that bridges are perhaps more than we consciously think about them, but uh, at some point – bridges are an act of faith Mm -hmm. you think you're just we think it's all going to be fine when we get to the other side and and you can look out on the other side you can see you know frequently you're crossing a bridge all you can see is air all you can see is you can't really see the support that exists underneath it and i find that symbolic of so many of the transitions in our lives too we can look to our left and look to our right we can see other people on the journey with us Mm -hmm. but we can't see what's holding us all up well said and suddenly, and then when it's not there, that's when we suddenly recognize the vulnerability of of all of those crossings and all of those journeys. I don't know. I was just something I was musing about while I was um, reading your book too, and and that's why I think it may be a good tie-in to talk about your various missions and the journeys you've been on. For example, you just got back from France. I did. I. Uh had taken a tour group with me over to some of the, the hot spots there, the energy centers, including Rennes-le-Chateau and a couple of Templar sites around Paris, various cathedrals. And then I hopped over to Switzerland and went to the particle accelerator at CERN and then visited another small uh, village called Sion, Switzerland, where some interesting mysteries are found. I don't know about that. Tell me about that. Well, there's this incredible image that I've used in my books for over 10 years. It it shows Joshua and Caleb, these two Old Testament figures, having stolen this oversized cluster of grapes from the Anunnaki at their stronghold at a place called Eshkol. They delivered this cluster of grapes to the crucifixion. And it's very strange because this otherworldly cluster of grapes has these really weird connections to uh, the possibility that the Anunnaki were u- utilizing space bridges or portals or stargates at this place, and that this 
oversized cluster of grapes might have symbolized some kind of exotic substance that Joshua and Caleb stole that is relative to these portals. And at this one church, this uh, small church in Sion, Switzerland, is where you find them delivering this exotic substance to the crucifixion. And I've, I've never seen it anywhere else, and I've been very uh, puzzled by it for years. So I finally got a chance to visit uh, Sion and see the uh, see this woodcut for myself, and it was really spectacular. It, any any thought on whether or not it is a symbolic representation of the metaphor that's used in the New Testament that uh, Gentiles have been grafted onto the vine? of of the chosen people they've been grafted onto the pre-existing vine through the cross well that's, um, that's definitely one level of interpretation on it another would be that the vine is symbolic of the way uh the way to heaven uh it's referred to as the vine of the soul sometimes um interestingly the cluster of grapes is is likened by uh astrophysicists, they, they look at the center of our Milky Way galaxy and say, hey, that looks like a cluster of grapes, too. So there might even be this other cosmic connection to it as well. So, I mean, there's so many different interpretations, and that would, that's what, to me, makes it such a remarkable image. Well, and the, and it's definitely the, the more cosmic interpretations which uh, take your work into these different dimensions, the dimension of the blessed just being one of them. We'll talk more about that. Um, and let me let me go back a little bit to kind of where we started. How, how did you get to become an investigative mythologist? Who who else are who else is out there that does that sort of work? And I mean, is that something you could actually like study for at a university? Do they? Because I know you you teach at universities, somebody you lecture at universities. Does anybody actually offer a degree in that? Well, there's uh, you can get degrees, uh, masters and PhDs in mythology from like Pacifica University, but I'm kind of uh, trailblazing in what I'm doing. And it's funny because I get emails all the time. How do I become an investigative mythologist? And people see the value in in looking to, at the the symbols that we use in our present culture and linking them to past ideas and historical events to see if, in fact, we are repeating history or if we are in the midst of some kind of an archetypal drama and that by following the symbols that are involved, we can move our way through that archetypal drama. So that's basically what I look for is what are the symbols that are being used at a place? What are the meaning behind those symbols? And what are we to attach to the, the current event or the, the situation that's utilizing those symbols? Well, then is that the difference between an investigative mythologist and a mythology investigator? Well, the other thing is is that I'm scholars, as you probably know, just abhor the idea of connecting dots. That is, it's virtually written in stone that you can't connect dots. And that's one of the, the liberties that I have as an investigative mythologist is it's okay to connect dots, to connect seemingly unconnected concepts or ideas and to look to, to integrate rather than, than to separate. So that's primarily what I'm all about is, is looking for dots that are kind of laying about or haven't previously been connected and find ways that we can connect them. And in so doing, it helps to kind of wire up the, the, the global consciousness, the divine mind, if you will, of humankind, and opens up new avenues of possibility. Well, um, let, me, let me push back a little bit on that then and say investigative mythologist or mythology investigator, if you're just a mythology investigator, then you might investigate where dots have been previously drawn. But as an investigative mythologist, would it be fair to say that you are actively engaged in myth creation or exploration in connecting dots that may never have been connected before? Yeah, sure. That's absolutely fair to say. I mean, and now is such an incredible time to be doing this kind of research because unlike previous famous mythologists such as Joseph Campbell, he he died just about the time the personal computer was being introduced and he readily apprehended that hey this is a this is a revolutionary technology. This is going to change everything. And today it, it's kind of like if you're investigating mythology, you are you're finding just nuggets of gold all over the place and, and new new ideas that are coming forward and, and connections to be made. 